Yeah. These guys have helped us turn them over. Good morning, David. Happy New Year to you. How are you? I'm very well indeed, thanks. Well rested. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, could I could I say a, a very, very, very warm uh, welcome to our guests uh, around the world, and, and indeed to thank you very much indeed for joining us at what must seem uh, an unearthly hour. Uh, it's snowing here in London, and I'm sure uh, you'll tell us what it's like around the world. We're, we're a very, very tight timescale, but I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves very, very briefly uh, so that we know that our feed is up and, uh, and live. Uh, but first, I'm going to reduce our committee to you. I'm Phil Willis, the, uh, the chairman of the Science and Technology Committee here in the House of Commons. And on my immediate right is... Dr. Brian Eden, um, Member of Parliament for Bolton South East Labour. Greg Stringer, Member of Parliament for Manchester Blakely. Ian Causey, Member of Parliament for Brig and Goo. Uh, and Tim Boswell, Member of Parliament for Daventry. And on my immediate left... Glenn McKee Clark. Uh, so that's, that's our panel this morning. I wonder if I could ask uh, John Virgo if you could identify yourself, please. Uh, I'm John Virgo. I'm on the line here from Canberra where we've been enjoying 38 degrees today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. And uh, uh, Professor Keith? David Keith, the uh, University of Calgary, where it's uh, around zero. <laughs> and what time in the morning is it? Uh, one thirty. No, no, it must be two thirty. Right. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Blackstock. Yes. Uh, is the audio working at this point in time? It yeah. certainly is. Yes. Wonderful. So I am in uh, Jason Blackstock from uh, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and the Center for International Governance and Innovation. I'm in Boston right now, and it's uh, four thirty in the morning and about zero Celsius. Right, okay. Well, um, uh, John Virgo, I wonder if I could uh, sort of start with you. It's been suggested that, um, that there is a need for geoengineering intervention. I mean, first of all, do you think that there is? And do you agree that it needs global regulation? Uh, on the need, I think it would be premature to make that judgment at this point. Um, the state of knowledge about geoengineering, both on the technical side, but also on the uh, political, um, ethical, and regulatory side, is simply not uh, at a point where I think any sensible person would be uh, able to recommend that we should be implementing a geoengineering uh, technique at this point. Um, I think, however, there is increasing reason to think that we may be heading that way in the future. Um, I suppose it depends to some extent on your degree of optimism about whether the world uh, will manage to get on top of global warming through the mitigation um, methods and through international negotiations. Um, if we believe that we may be heading that di in, in that direction and that in some years from now, um, and I wouldn't like to put a figure on it, but some years from now we may be looking seriously at geoengineering intervention, um, I think it does make sense for us to be starting at this point, not only researching the, uh, the science and the technology, but also to be thinking through some of these issues around the politics and the regulation, uh, so that when we do get to the point, um, if we get to that point, um, where we want to go ahead with this, these sorts of acts, um, we've actually thought about it and we're in a position to take a mature and measured and informed decision. If we, uh, Dr. Blackstock, if we actually take John Virgo's position as, as a sensible starting point, um, there are a huge number of international conventions uh, with the potential to regulate geoengineering. Um, is there sufficient out there, or do we need to, uh, to establish new positions? Dr. Blackstock, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I, I was just saying that there are a huge number of international conventions with the potential to uh, regulate geoengineering. Uh, is that so, or do we need new ones? I think this depends in part on the types of geoengineering that you're talking about. Geoengineering isn't a monolithic uh, uh, subject 
with the, with the differences between carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management, and even within carbon dioxide removal, the types that are engineered and therefore can be done at a very local scale versus the ecosystem management, each of them requires different types of regulation and different regulatory structures. I think that yes, for the, the engineered carbon dioxide yeah. removal, we do have uh, methods in place. We, we, that, that can fit largely within the, the, the local and national regulatory structures. But once you start getting into uh, managing ecosystems or, in, one one. or in, uh, interventions into ecosystems at a larger scale and across borders, we start to have more questions. So CDR that's ecosystem-based, like ocean fertilization, has already gone to the Convention on Biological Diversity and the London Convention, and we have some regulatory mechanisms there. But for solar radiation management, I think we really lack the regulatory structure right now. And that, because solar radiation management, the sort of techniques of stratospheric aerosols or cloud lightning, are, are the only category of techniques that could be used with a rapid impact on the climate system if we were to intervene, I think that leads leads us to a concern that there are not appropriate, that without appropriate regulatory structure, we could end up with, uh, we need to get those regulatory structures in place before a large, large scale field tests are implemented. Because even when you start talking about field testing solar radiation management techniques, you start running into potential for transboundary impacts, or at least the perception of transboundary impacts. And so international mistrust, international uh, concern over what another country will do with that technology can come up fairly rapidly. So are you saying, uh, Dr. Blackstock, that the Convention on Biological Diversity would be a good starting point, or are you saying that that is sufficient? I, I'm saying that, that for the different techniques, we need different systems. We cannot, there, there will not be, and I don't think we should think about there as being one framework which is sufficient to regulate geoengineering as a whole. For the, if, if we differentiate the categories of geoengineering into the two broad categories of carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management, I think those techniques that aim to remove carbon dioxide <coughs> from the atmosphere, we largely have the appropriate regulatory mechanisms. There are some changes that could be made, but they largely exist. For solar radiation management, on the other hand, I believe we do not have the appropriate regulatory mechanisms in place, and I don't believe we have even a forum in which that discussion has begun to occur. I think we need more discussion uh, at the international level about what, what type of regulatory mechanisms are needed, and that, and that discussion should begin soon. But Mr. Virgo, you, you disagree with that. You feel that, um, you know, that we, we need a single regulatory body. And I just wondered if you would let our committee know how you think that that could work. Well, in fact, I don't disagree with that. I agree with almost everything that Dr. Blackstock said, said at that point. Um, I certainly agree that when we're talking about CO2 removal, um, the aspiration at least must be to make this part of a broader uh, greenhouse gas management um, regulatory structure. Um, the, once we've addressed the issues um, around measurability and verification, um, uh, the efficiency of some of these methods, um, then ideally we will be looking to see these methods implemented uh, as part of a portfolio if the price makes it sensible to do, to, to do it that way. So that a country is faced with, um, fa faced with uh, emissions reduction targets um, would have the option and it will be a, a, a market-driven process um, to what extent they wish to meet those through uh, Does that mean that? I, I agree with him entirely. We don't have the structures in place um, which would uh, allow us to take the decisions and to regulate that process. Um, the, one, the one area that, that I would differ slightly with him on that is I would certainly agree that we need to start the conversation around these issues as soon as possible. But that doesn't mean that we should necessarily be jumping straight into an international negotiation. Um, the state of knowledge around these techniques, around the possible unintended, unintended consequences, 
um, are, are such that I just don't think we have enough knowledge um, to get into that sort of international negotiation, um, and that actually getting into that international negotiation could lead us to some, uh, to some unwanted consequences. Um, but I certainly think we need to start the discussion, um, and we need to start the discussion in particular around how we're going to manage the process of researching these things. Okay. Prof Professor Keith, we've just had um, a rather disappointing Copenhagen summit um, where with arguably sort of science uh, coalescing around uh, a, 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 a clear understanding that the planet is, um, is, is warming up and that we need to take very, very drastic action. We've still failed to be able to get the sorts of compensation agreements uh, to, to support uh, countries that, are, that require a great deal of support in order to put in carbon mitigation measures. And how do you feel, do you feel that there would need to be significant compensation uh, for geoengineering which might be placed uh, or deployed by one nation but have quite a significant effect on another? Do you think that's possible to work that out? Conceivable, but it's very hard. But first, I can't see any video. Can you hear me? We can hear you, so just please carry on. We can see you now as well. So again, talking about geoengineering in general is almost meaningless because there are completely different things meant by it. So I think your question really refers to solar radiation management. And in that case, governance is central to what the point will be like. And the reason is, it's so cheap that the challenge for the international system will be to restrain unilateral action. It's precisely the opposite or the converse of the kind of challenge we face with reducing CO2 emissions, where the challenge is to incent expensive collective action. So I think we will need mechanisms to do that. And indeed, those may be some of the most challenging uh, uh, developments, such mechanisms may be some of the most challenging problems the international community has ever faced. I don't think it makes sense to begin now to develop the full mechanisms for managing full-scale deployment, because I think we simply don't know enough. So I agree with what John Burgo was saying. I think the crucial thing now is to think about how to start doing this from the bottom up through the management of a research program in an international and transparent way. And from the bottom up doesn't mean just that the scientists decide a certain number of answer, but it means, I think, that it would be premature to start a the full UN scale leading towards a treaty process because it's simply not clear yet what the capacities are and states and individuals haven't had the long enough to consider seriously what the trade-offs are. Could I ask you all, uh, just very, very briefly before I pass you on to uh, Dr. Eden, whether you find that um, uh, it's it sort of come to my attention that there is a real worry that if I, the, it, the, the military <clears throat> uh, use of geoengineering uh, might become an attractive proposition for some, some countries. Is that something that worries you, Dr. Uh, John Berger? Yes. Yes. Well, um, I, I, I understand the concern. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is that such action would actually be uh, prohibited by the 1977 Enmont Convention. Uh, which does uh, outlaw the hostile military use um, of environmental modification techniques. Um, that doesn't mean, however, that um, the development of these sort of techniques wouldn't, uh, wouldn't give rise to concerns. Um, and that's certainly the case if, if um, uh, militaries um, or what in the powerful governments who are seen to be involved in developing some of these techniques. And I think one of the big challenges for, um, for the world will be if we decide to move ahead with researching and possibly deploying these sort of techniques, um, how do you actually deal with those sort of concerns? Uh, as I say, I think what the, the, the legal position is that, they, that this would not be allowed uh, under the convention, but uh, that doesn't mean there wouldn't be concerns about it, certainly. Pro Professor Keith? I would, uh, I would echo Mr. Burgo's comments on this. Okay. And... Uh, uh, Let's, let's, let's try getting a scenario on the table. So if a very small state right now decided to unilaterally deploy geoengineering with no prior consultation and, uh, and with no adequate monitoring and so on, then whether or not we had some prearranged 
international regime, it's pretty clear that the great powers would stop that small state. On the other hand, if a large state, and that doesn't necessarily mean a rich first world country, if a large state began a serious 10-year program of uh, geoengineering research, uh, subscale testing, and if that program had some international transparency in the form of an advisory committee that has some of the world's best scientists, maybe a deployment committee with some of the most respected retired politicians in the world, and then that state moved after, say, a decade to say, we're going to begin slowly and, and incrementally subscale deployment because we feel it will protect our and the world's interests, it would be extremely hard to stop. That state would effectively have seized the initiative, especially if it was a nuclear arms state. Okay. The reality here is that there's limits to what we can do in international law because in the end, this gets to core national interests. And that's not to say we shouldn't try because I think in the end, the stability of the world is going to depend on the But I want to use this example to give you a sense of just how challenging this will be. Let's say China decides to do some modification that, that they think will improve their monsoon and it makes India's monsoon worse. That won't be direct action, which, as John said, is prohibited by the Enmar Treaty, but there's no question that at that level, military is on all sides of the concern. Uh, just, just bring in. I, I would just build off of uh, Professor Keith's statement just quickly and say that. Those two scenarios that he painted are the ends of the spectrum of possibilities, but as the geoengineering research is developing, particularly on solar radiation management, somewhere in the middle ground seems more likely at this stage, where powerful nations begin research programs on geoengineering, and other states' perceptions of how transparent that is. Uh, for example, the, the EU, the UK, the US, are all having these conversations about geoengineering, developing countries aren't yet present. And even the perception that powerful countries are beginning to develop these technologies and may be pursuing not necessarily militaristic interests, but simply national climatic interests by developing these technologies, could have, we need to consider the knock-on consequences, those sorts of perceptions, that middle ground perception will have, for example, on the next attempt at Copenhagen, the next attempt to get mitigation discussions going. Um, there will be these contacts. I would agree with Mr. Virgo and with the statements I put before that we're not ready for international negotiations. But I think that an, an attempt to, that particularly by countries who are now starting serious geoengineering research, there needs to be an attempt to engage a broader dialogue with those countries who would otherwise feel marginalized from these countries. Okay, okay. Very briefly, yeah. my specific question was about um, the regulation of these processes and, the, and what might be termed the international validation of them. Uh, it would seem to me, and this prompted my asking to intervene, that the UN Charter and the principle of self-defense at one level could actually be invoked by a nation state who wanted to do this by saying it's essential we do this in order to protect ourselves. So perhaps you'd like to comment on that. And secondly, and I mean, there is some analogy with uh, the development of nuclear programs, for example, in states which are not at the moment nuclear weapon states. Uh, there may be some suggestion that they are sh able to shelter under civilian regimes in order to develop what are essentially nuclear pro um, military programs. Any comments on those two? Dr. Let me, Blatt. David Keith here, let me pick up on the, on, the, on the connection of nuclear weapons and point out that we don't just succeed in international international debate by formal treaties. Norms of behavior can be very important even if they're not formal written treaties. So the norm that said we should no state should have a first use of nuclear weapons, a no first use norm, had a profound role in the Cold War, and yet it wasn't the core of any treaty. And I think what we need to develop here are both norms and treaties. And we shouldn't walk up on necessarily getting the retreat. Okay. okay, I'm going to leave that there and come and bring Dr. Bryden in. Um, uh, good morning, gentlemen. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, are we quite clear about the uh, the width of geoengineering? What I mean by that is that uh, weather changing techniques such as cloud seeding might be considered to be geoengineering. Do you encompass those techniques within your definition? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, can we start with John Virgo, perhaps? Uh, I certainly wouldn't encompass that. Uh, one of the criteria for me for geoengineering is that the effect needs to be uh, at the global level, um, and cloud seeding um, is, is a weather modification technique. Um, I, I, mean, I think the, uh, we shouldn't get hung up, though, on the precise definition of geoengineering for a couple of reasons. One, one of the term is a very scary term, and I think it does inhibit sensible debate uh, around these techniques. The, the second is that the, the term has come to encompass at least two quite different things, um, which are both technically different um, in uh, talking about um, techniques for, for solar radiation management on the one hand and for uh, taking CO2 or other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere on the other. They're quite different technically, but also in terms of their non-technological uh, implications. Uh, and certainly, I, I, I find it more helpful to think in terms of uh, unconventional or complementary techniques. Uh, and let's look at them one by one rather than, I think the category of geoengineering is possibly uh, starting to no longer be a particularly helpful one. Professor Keith, do you uh, agree or disagree with John Virgo? Strongly agree. I think strongly agree. I think we all three of us said that in different ways. Let's let, let's try and help this by being specific. So if if um, uh, if, if, if biochar is geoengineering, it certainly doesn't bring up the kinds of direct international security concerns brought up by the capacity to um, stratosphere solar radiation management. And the reason is all about leverage and money. The fact is, with the right technology, it may be cheap enough. Uh, uh, through engineering the stratosphere that uh, literally individual human beings may have the wealth necessary to induce an ice age. I say that to be deliberately profitable, but there's evidence that that is in fact correct. And that enormous leverage that comes from being so cheap means that the, the threat of unilateral action is real and the impacts could be very substantial. There's just no comparable issue with, say, biochar. And for that reason, the sort of regulation and management we need are completely different. Uh, Dr. Blackstock, do you have any I, comment? I would echo, I would echo the comments uh, that, that were just made and, and build off of them just saying that it's the transboundary impacts. It's the impacts that go beyond the boundary of one country that are really going to drive the international regulatory frameworks that we need to develop. And so for a working definition of geoengineering, there's, there's obviously the questions of intentional uh, intervention in the climate system. And as, as David Keith just raised, biochar does have the intent of lowering global atmospheric concentrations or keeping global atmospheric concentrations of CO2 down. But the, the, the near-term transboundary impacts are minimal. It's when we think about developing regulatory structures for what we class as geoengineering, our primary concern should be about how large is the transboundary impact and how soon will that transboundary impact manifest. This is what focuses a lot of the conversation, as you've heard, on solar radiation management, the fact that that can impact the climate system in the near term, whereas the CDR techniques, the carbon dioxide removal techniques, have a much longer lag time behind them. And just to echo the last, uh, the last question that was asked about nuclear technology and build on Professor Keith's point, the, and as, as David mentioned a couple of times now, solar radiation management technologies appear relatively cheap, which also means relatively technically simplistic. Therefore, the, the, the analogy to nuclear weapons becomes much more challenging because, or to, to nuclear technologies because most of the technologies required to actually deploy solar radiation management are things that are available to numerous countries already. These are not technologies that require huge technological progress from where existing technologies are at. And so the idea that we can potentially regulate and control the technology underlying solar radiation management, like we do or attempt to do with nuclear technologies, is not a good analogy for this. The technology is going to proliferate and be accessible to a large number of individuals or countries, and therefore we have to look at controlling behaviors in this case, not just access to technology. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my second question is about risk. Should we be categorizing geoengineering techniques as low risk, medium risk, and high risk, 
And if you agree with that, should there be separate regulatory regimes for each risk area? Could I start with uh, Dr. Blackstock, please? Um, I think that, that simply having three categories of low, medium, and high risk are, uh, as we've already sort of echoed all three of us, that, that's, that there are slightly different things you would want to lump categories that you, you would want to define the technologies according to. But yes, we do. I, I think what you've heard echoed here already is an attempt to classify things in, in precisely that way. The high risk uh, technologies in this case that we've been discussing, uh, or high risk geoengineering methods, are those of solar radiation management because of both the, the cheapness, the, low, the, the, the cheap and easy technology for implementation, the near term impact that it can have, and therefore the potential for unilateral action. That creates the high risk category that does require a different type of regulatory framework than, for example, is necessary for biochar or the other carbon dioxide removal techniques. So that is a useful framework of low, medium, and high risk, but there are more that understanding why those classifications of higher risk versus lower risk are made is, it will be a very important part of any regulatory framework. And that echoes Mr. Burgo's comment that we need a lot more research to understand these. Uh, the, the science underlying these techniques before uh, in, going to full-scale negotiations and real international regulation. Professor Keith, do you agree? I, I don't think that I don't think that <coughs> leaving everything. Yes, I, I generally agree with what Professor Blackwell said. Uh, I think that categorizing things by the amount of leverage might be more useful than by the risk. So there are things that have low leverage where. You know, it's impossible for a small amount of money or a small state to affect the globe and may have higher low risk. And those things don't need the kind of international governance we will eventually need for these high leverage technologies like solar radiation management. So I think actually the high, low, medium risk categorization is not a particularly useful way to think about overall governance. We can think about the specific, very different time scales and leverage. John Virgo, finally. Uh, I would agree with, with both of those comments. And, and just observe that um, I think we're talking about a number of different sorts of risk here. And it's going to be important to pick these apart. But there are environmental risks, risks of things going wrong or risks of unintended uh, side effects. There are also political risks, and we've touched on some of these already, and I think there are a number of other uh, potential political risk, risks to uh, the international system um, to multilateral or bilateral relations is a, something that particularly concerns me. There is clearly a risk that the techniques don't work, um, and there are also risks around things like um, legal issues and liability. Um, so I think there, there are a whole range, a whole range of different risks, um, and we probably need quite a sophisticated um, framework for, for assessing those. But ultimately, you're right, uh, we will be in the business of, of balancing risks um, and balancing them against the risk of runaway climate change, essentially. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Could I move on to um, to Boswell? Um, thank you. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Virgo, if I may, because in your paper, which is very helpful, you suggested developing guidelines that would apply into the whole area of research into geoengineering. My first question is, who should be formulating these? Should this be individual governments? Uh, should it be international organizations? Or possibly, should it be some kind of consortia of academics or NGOs that does it? I think that's an extremely interesting question. Um, I do think that the development of, uh, I suppose, what might more appropriately be called norms or principles um, is the first task. Uh, and it's a particularly urgent task, given the, uh, the urgent need to, to restrain what we might call uh, irresponsible or activity in this field. We need to develop these norms, and we need to socialise them among the community of nations and among the community of scientists and other stakeholders. Um, how do we do that? Um, I, 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 as I suggested earlier, um, I, I'm not, I, I don't see um, turning in, in the early instance to the international multilateral process. 
um, Nehla naming it a treaty uh, uh, as the right way to go in this. I think the state of international knowledge, or uh, the state of international understanding, and also the knowledge base, um, it, it is currently so weak that you could get um, outcomes that would not, be, would not be the right one. I think it's very possible to uh, imagine if this is put on the table in some sort of UN form, forum, you end up with uh, a, a, a decision basically to make geoengineering a taboo to outlaw it. And I think that would be a mistake for a couple of reasons. One is that um, it may be that we actually need to be doing this research and that some decades down the line, we will be very sorry if we haven't started um, thinking through these techniques. Um, the second is that I think um, there are a lot of actors out there, as, as we've already all already said several times, with the capacity to uh, research and implement these techniques. Some of them may not be may not feel bound by that sort of international decision. Um, some of them may not be as responsible, um, and it will be very unfortunate if what geoengineering research uh, was happening was going on uh, under the radar screen, if you like. What we need is, a, is an open process which builds on some of the principles that are already out there um, around uh, similar issues. Principles um, developed, for example, to deal with um, long range air, air pollution, with weather, weather modification principles around openness, around um, transparency in research, around uh, notifying neighboring countries or countries which might be affected. Um, and we, we probably develop these through um, uh, may, maybe a slightly messier process in an international negotiation. Individual countries will have a role. Uh, communities of scientists will certainly have a role. And I think if you look at some analogs, for example, around um, uh, genetic engineering or around uh, fusion physics, um, or indeed around carbon capture and storage to come a bit closer to home. Um, you, can see, uh, you can see examples where research norms and principles um, have been developed from almost from the bottom up in that way, in, involving uh, a sort of flexible <coughs> geometry of groups of scientists, other stakeholders, and interested countries. Very helpful. Um, would the other two, like Professor Keith or Dr. Blackstock, like to comment on it? Yeah, yeah. David Keith here, I, I, I agree. I think there's a, a role for there's a role for bottom-up generation of norms and that has to start most of all with just transparency and openness. And I think there are parts of the international scientific community, such as the National Academies and the mechanisms that link the National Academies like the International the Inter Academy Council, that can play an important role there. That's not to say that this should just be the domain of scientists, because there shouldn't be. It's vital that we find a way to get a larger set of voices in here and not have the reality or perception be that the scientific community alone is deciding what to do purely based on research interests. But one of the one of the wonderful things about the global scientific community has been its ability to operate internationally and with some level of transparency, even in the middle of a Cold War. And I think that uh, building on that uh, is, is a sort of key way to start. But it needs to be done in many places, and we need to have different um, different efforts to develop these uh, uh, norms of behavior going on at once. I think it would be a mistake to look for a single unified system too early. OK. Dr. I would just add one thing to, uh, to on top of what my colleagues have said, which is when speaking about research on low scales where the research itself has no transboundary impact, so for example, the development of technologies, the deployment of technologies, laboratory research, computational modeling, for that, the, the framework of developing norms within the scientific community as a bottom-up process, I think, is very applicable and works very well. I am more skeptical, however, that when we start talking about field tests, particularly of what Professor Keith has been referring to as high leverage geoengineering technologies, yeah. which are specifically the solar radiation management type, when we start talking about field tests... Uh, it typically, typically I, I interrupt you, typically crossing national boundaries at that level. The, field, the field tests will be typically... Yeah. Yeah, well, at some scale, you can do, you can do what, what we, you would refer to as subscale field tests, which are tests of such a small scale that they don't have transboundary impact. But defining where that boundary is between 
subscale and actually having transdermal impact. And this goes a little bit to what Mr. Burgos just said. There's two types of risks. There's the actual technical risk, the environmental risk, but then there's the political risk and just the perception. One can conduct what is nominally a subscale test, but the political perceptions of your neighbors may be different to that. And so when talking about the types of research that begin to get into actual environmental testing of these technologies, I think we have to be more cautious about proceeding based on norms and alone prior to a political agreement. And we saw an example of this this last year with the ocean fertilization experiment, the uh, Lolfax example that was the, uh, the Indo-German collaboration that ran it, and the political controversy that emerged surrounding that. Not only that test would have had very subscale impacts in terms of the ecosystems and certainly in terms of transboundary, but yet the political controversy it raised because of the perceptions and the fact that the Convention on Biological Diversity and the London Convention had already been discussing these issues. You see, when you start doing field tests, you start raising more political issues that I think the consideration of what the norms are, are necessary but not sufficient to address the sort of political issues that will raise. Okay. Um, Second question, really for all of you, um, by prefacing it, I think I'd say that it sounds to me as if the words norms, um, guidelines and principles are pretty well interchangeable, and you might like to comment on that. But uh, a group of leading academics have suggested five key principles, that's the word they use, for guiding research. Uh, broadly, first of all, that geoengineering be regulated as a public good, Secondly, the importance of public participation in decision-making. Third, disclosure of geoengineering research and open publication of results. Fourth, the independent assessment of impacts. And fifth, governance before deployment. I think that last one implies that you start the guidelines and you work on the governance at the stage where you need to perhaps develop specific research projects. Um, they sound pretty good to me, at first sight, but are they practicable as a basis for at least starting to consider the acceptability of research? Uh, would Dr. Virgo like to start on that, or whoever? I'm, I'm happy to go first, but I should say I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Virgo. On the five, on, on the five key principles, um, I, I also agree that they sound pretty good at first sight, or at least three of them do. Um, I, I would absolutely agree that um, with the principle of uh, open public publication and, and disclosure of research, and I think this is, this is absolutely key, um, the, the, the surest way to excite international suspicion about what you're doing is not to be open about it. Uh, and that applies whether you're a community of scientists or whether you're a government, of course. Um, <coughs> really happens first. Um, Independent assessment of, of, of impacts sounds like a good idea to me as well. The two that I, I, I have some question marks over are the first two, however. Um, implementation in the public good, um, well, yes, it's, it's sort of motherhood and apple pie, but I think when you delve below that, you have to ask who is the public in this case? Um, the global public. Uh, we're talking about uh, interventions which will affect the planet as a whole, and there are a number of publics out there. Um, there are some publics out there who are suffering very badly or will be suffering very badly from the effects of climate change. Um, there are some populations out there who may see some benefit from climate change um, and therefore uh, not be very happy to see climate change being uh, put into reverse gear if we were ever able to achieve that. Um, the impact of some of these techniques is likely to be um, heavily differentiated. Um, it's not necessarily the case that we will simply be able to um, slow climate change um, at the same rate across the world or put it into reverse at the same rate across the world. You may find um, some areas uh, continuing to warm, other areas cooling faster, um, and of course unintentional side, side effects. So I, I think once you um, peer below the surface of, of the public good, it becomes quite hard to um, it becomes quite hard to find as you get into some difficult uh, ethical territory. As far as public participation is concerned, um, it, again, it sounds good, but I find it a little bit hard to imagine quite what that means at the global level. How do you actually um, bring about public participation at the global level? And how do you ensure, ensure that 
uh, certain parts of the public, or the public in certain countries, uh, do not have privileged, privileged access um, compared with other countries' publics or other parts of the global public. Here. Could I, I ask you to be as brief as you can, please? Because I'm, I'm desperately trying to get in another set of questions before we run out of our link. Could I just ask you to be very brief in your answers, please? Dr. Keith? Okay, I, I want to return to the previous conversation because I think it got onto a key point where there is a little bit of disagreement probably between us. So, uh, um, Dr. Blackstock was suggesting that we shouldn't, uh, that we need to have political agreement before we do any subscale testing. And I would submit that that is problematic. For one thing, the Russians are already doing subscale testing, just to be blunt about it. For another thing, um, it's recently become clear that the, despite all the talk about uh, uh, stratospheric geoengineering, the main method people talk about basically doesn't work. That is, if you put sulfur in the stratosphere the way we've been assuming, it doesn't do what we thought. You could do tests on this at the level that are tons, not megatons. These would have no detectable climate effect, but they would be subscale tests. Somehow. And if we want to actually understand whether this technology works or it doesn't, we need to do those relatively soon. And if we say we're not going to allow them until we have a political agreement, that essentially gives a veto to any power that doesn't want to see that. And I think we have to really think hard about whether that would be a, a appropriate strategy or whether the default outcome of that would be that there was no serious progress in our scientific understanding. I would just quickly respond to Professor Keith's point and say I, 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 I agree with most of what he just said. The, the issue that I am trying to raise is the question of what are the, how will the politics play out? As he pointed out, Russia has begun, begun doing subscale field tests. And they are extremely subscale at, at a point where there will clearly be no transboundary impact. And they're, well, I, I would agree that we want to progress our science, and we will need to do some of this subscale testing to understand the feasibility of some of these technologies. We want some international mechanism, some mechanism of legitimacy for defining what subscale actually means to begin with. And then before we start pushing the boundaries of what questionability of subscale, that's, I believe, where we really need to have not just scientific but political uh, agreement. And as Professor Keith raised before, the National Academies, the international grouping of national academies, could be the right body for being able to make a declarative statement about a subscale test being actually subscale. But if they cannot reach it, if there will be cases where the politics will overrun that. And we just need to be very individual scientists and particularly nation states supporting subscale testing need to be very aware of the political issues it can raise and be proactive. And that just in responding directly to this last question, norms, guidelines, and principles are all, I feel, interchangeable words, but what I think needs to be considered are commitments. These principles, there are, there are some debate as to how to operationalize these principles, but I think that nation states who are now starting to fund research, particularly if it goes to funding subscale experimentation, we need to ask what uh, preventive commitments or precautionary commitments nation states need to make about the sort of research and transparency uh, that they are going to commit to up front in order to avoid exacerbating all of the mistrust that already exists within the international climate arena. Thank you very much indeed. And finally, can I just bring on uh, uh, Ian Corsi? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Virgo, in your uh, written submission to us, you make the point that it would be necessary to be cautious in the way international debates on ge geoengineering is initi initiated. And indeed, you went further to say it may well be banned in line with the precautionary principle if we don't. Why do you think this might happen? Should we prevent it? And indeed, can we? I think we can, pre we can try to prevent it by being careful in the way that we, that we raise the issue. Um, to take a very crude example, if you were to take a proposal uh, around geoengineering straight to the floor of the United Nations uh, in whatever for, uh, format um, you like, um, you have to think about the politics of, of how countries would respond to that. Um, at the moment, the state of knowledge uh, around geoengineering, the state of understanding, is, is, is not great. Um, 
I think a number of countries will be, will be very, very alarmed by that proposal. Uh, a number of countries might see it as an attempt by the developed nations to uh, escape from having to make cuts in their, in their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, others might uh, be very excited to hear about this potential solution to climate change. Um, and so I think the, the consequences of that sort of unprepared debate in that sort of format would be very unpredictable, but you might get uh, a, a decision of one extreme or the other, either to ban geoengineering um, or to rush ahead with it um, when we're really not at the point where we can uh, say that, that this is at all a sensible road to be going down. Um, so that's why I'm arguing for a much more cautious uh, and bottom-up uh, approach to putting this on the international uh, agenda. The UK's Natural Environment Research Council has launched a public consultation on geoengineering and it's asked for comments on two topics, what are your thoughts on hopes and concerns about the potential use of geoengineering technology and what questions people should be asked about the future of geoengineering research. Uh, is that going too far too quickly or is that sensible? Uh, do you support that consultation and what issues and options should be considered? And I'll start with Mr Virgo but I'd be interested in what other witnesses have to say as well. I thought that was a very interesting initiative um, and um, seems to me to be a a sensible way of starting to spark debate. <coughs> Professor Keith? For all the consultations to really work, it, it requires more than just having an open door for public to throw comments in. I think that's a necessity, but it's really not sufficient. Uh, good public consultation requires a capacity to help give uh, uh, members of the public the tools to uh, um, ask scientists what's going on and understand the technical facts. And it, it typically is more effective as a small group of, of, of um, representatives of public of, of, uh, uh, get to debate and work issues out for themselves and then report. There are various methods in this kind of uh, precipitatory, precipitatory democracy that can work. And I think the pure kind of classic public consultation like that may not be all that helpful. Dr. Blackstock? I would, I would echo that statement from Professor Keith that a more active uh, educational role or involvement in, in, in education of both these ideas is essential. And I would just build back off of something that Mr. Virgo raised in his, in, in, in his uh, uh, framing of how we could go wrong by rushing forward into the international community. This, this program of starting communications within the UK is a good start, but because of the truly international scope of these geoengineering technologies that we're talking about, we have to ask ourselves who are going to be some of the most sensitive international, sensitive uh, portions or communities within the international sphere who we definitely need to take a proactive role in engaging in the conversation early. And I can think particularly about countries who are already have populations on, on marginalized in terms of climate change or on the edge of suffering from climate change impacts because those marginalized populations are likely to be the ones most sensitive to geoengineering experiments, and the sort of high leverage solar radiation management experiments, and particularly the implementation. And there is that risk that uh, without directed public engagement, an attempt to reach out and provide the information proactively and engage in the conversation, that we end up with them inevitably being surprised later on by rapid climate change impacts for these technologies, which can lead to, to sort of unilateral and rash actions that we've been trying to steer uh, that, that by doing informed research and responsible research we can hopefully avoid. But that requires international public uh, consultation, not just domestic. Right, okay, so I, mean, I was going to go on about the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council undertaking workshops and sampling events uh, and ask if you thought other countries should do the same or whether it should be internationally focused, but you're clearly saying you think this should be an international uh, endeavour, not just done by individual states. Dr. I think that would be my, my opinion on this, yeah. yes. Mr. Virgo? Um, I certainly agree with all of that. Um, I think um, you have to look at the physical structures in some of the countries that I think we're referring to um, and ask yourself whether going straight to a public consultation actually um, would, would make sense. Um, but the, the broad principle that we have to 
um, avoid any anybody, any country, certainly any uh, any powerful country, feeling either uh, threatened or suspicious or surprised by any action or discussions we may be having in this area. I absolutely agree with that principle. Um, absolutely. I'll have to, 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 to call this session to a halt, and uh, sorry, Dr. Keith, not to bring you in there. Well, can I thank you all very, very much indeed for, for joining us on what is the beginning of a journey. It's a piece of work we are doing jointly with the, uh, the U.S. Congress Science and Technology uh, Committee, but we thank you very much indeed, Dr. Black, Dr. Professor Keith, and John Virgo, Virgo for, your, for your help and your quest answering our questions this morning. Uh, we wish you either a good night or a good morning. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we could bring our second panel on uh, straight away this morning, we'll move on. <laughs> and. I think that works okay. Yeah. 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 We should have to face. No. We welcome, we welcome our second uh, uh, panel this, uh, this morning, uh, Dr. Martin van Alst, uh, who's uh, flown in this morning from Holland, and we thank you very much indeed, uh, Martin, for, for, for doing that. Um, and uh, an old friend uh, of, uh, of the Science and Technology Committee, uh, former Government Chief Scientific Advisor, uh, Dr. Uh, Sir, Sir David uh, King. Um, sadly, we're losing, we've lost our third panel member uh, who should have been joining us, Dr. Kilparte uh, Ramakrishna, uh, who should have been uh, coming to us from India. Uh, but unfortunately, our video link has, uh, has not uh, worked, which is sad, but it means we have more time for our two distinguished uh, uh, guests this morning, two uh, witnesses. And I wonder if I could start uh, with you, Graham Stringer, in this round of questioning. Yeah. Should we be putting a, a lot of investment into geo geoengineering research at the present time? Dr. King. David King. Good morning. Delighted to be here. Can I congratulate you on conducting much of this by video conference, which must have saved a lot of combats. So, and in a sense, that reply addresses, addresses this question because, uh, quite clearly, um, the major effort has to be around defossilizing our economies, um, and. The, the, the point about defossilizing our economies is that it manages a problem which is an anthropogenic problem uh, uh, directly rather than indirectly, which is what we've been discussing this morning. Uh, it gets right to the root of the problem. And I think that while there are real concerns about what the impact on e economic growth might be, I don't really share those concerns. If, if we manage the transition over the next 40 years into a defossilized economy, I think we can manage it um, and at the same time even get a boost to growth through the innovation that, uh, that follows from this necessity to move away from high carbon technologies. Now, the, the, the shorter sort of answer to your question is however, and it's a very important however, we need to factor in the probability distribution functions that the best science can deliver around what the temperature rise for the planet will be, even at a level, let's say, of 450 parts per million of greenhouse gas CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere. Because if we, if we get to that point, we, at the best that science can tell us at the moment is that the eventual temperature rise is going to lie somewhere between 1 degree centigrade and 4 degrees centigrade, um, with a peak in that property distribution function above 2 degrees centigrade. And so we only have a 50% chance of staying below a 2 degree centigrade rise. So there is still, for example, a 20% chance that the temperature rise will be above 3.5 degrees centigrade. And I'm putting to you the idea that the 450 part per million figure is what we ought to 
aim for globally. It's the lowest figure that's manageable. But even there, we have to manage risks by keeping in reserve an alternative way forward. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me say I'm not speaking on behalf of either the British Red Cross or the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, but in a personal expert capacity. Um, I, I would echo many of these remarks. I think we need to be cautious in investing at too large a scale to even give the impression that this is a suitable alternative in the short term to mitigation, or I would add, uh, much more extensive capacity building and adaptation, especially among the most vulnerable groups. Um, so I, I, would, I would just um, add to that. Um, on the, the side of the risks, I agree that it's something that we might want to have up our sleeves, and we're nowhere near the level of um, certainty about what these different options are, uh, that we could consider these options uh, that, we, that we have at this stage. So further research in that sense on a small scale to get slightly further in our understanding would be important. Uh, but to give you my, my primary perspective on that right away, um, it's not about watts per square meter, it's about people. Um, so I think in looking at those options, those distributional effects, and in particular um, the, the effects on the groups already most affected by the climate change as we see it progressing, and the end of the probability distribution, not just in terms of the global temperature rise, but also the impacts from there, uh, would be crucial. So, so David, when you were <coughs> advising on the preparation for the climate change bill, and one part of good regulation is you look at different alternatives to the proposals in the climate change bill. Did, did you seriously consider uh, geoengineering and uh, the costs and benefits of geoengineering uh, as against uh, CO2 reduction? Um, I think the answer is yes, seriously consider, but then following my, the answer to my previous question, I don't see that um, what we're now discussing, the geoengineering issues, should be a highly profiled uh, way forward. In other words, it is something, to repeat, that should be there, kept in reserve. There should be a significant effort made both into research and into regulation at this stage, but I don't think that the effort should match uh, in any way. No, I understand, the other that. I, I understand the arguments. What I suppose what I'm really asking is when you were doing the regulatory impact assessment to, uh, on, on the climate change bill, did you quantify uh, the, the costs and benefits of uh, geoengineering against the reduction of the mitigation of carbon dioxide? Um. In, in a, a very simple answer is, is no, right. uh, simply because... Very clear answer, no. Right. <laughs> so, but let me just say, simply because the, the, the cost of carbon dioxide capture from the top end of a coal-fired power station is already rather large, and there's a much higher density of carbon dioxide at that point of the atmosphere than in the general atmosphere where it's only 400 parts per million. So the, the cost... Uh, at, at our present estimates is already expensive from the top end of a coal-fired power station and in my view is prohibitive. Uh, so I'm, I, it wasn't eliminated without examination. Thanks. Geoengineering is going up the agenda in, in a way. More people are talking about it. Where, where do you think the pressure uh, is coming from uh, uh, for a, a, a greater in investment in geoengineering? Is it from industry, NGOs, people who are profoundly sceptical about global warming? Uh, I, I don't think it's any of the above. I, right, I, right. I, think, I think it's more a pressure coming from uh, uh, people who, A, are concerned about us not managing the problem by defossilizing, but secondly, uh, a group of people who... Um, don't wish to go around the defossilizing route uh, and, and would like to provide an alternative. And uh, I, I fear that this, uh, there may be um, quite a large group emerging, particularly in the United States, who, who, who would come from that particular line. Dr. Manos? Yes, that's my impression as well. I think this, on the scientific side, this debate was probably started by people with a genuine concern of wanting to map out these options for that tail end of the distribution. I think we're now in a shift, uh, and with political attention growing, there's also political attention from the other side. 
um, and I would also be cautious, uh, in including uh, uh, the caution of establishing very large research programs, which might be interpreted as on a similar scale as uh, the investments we're making in mitigation and adaptation. Do, I was going to say, do you think that the risks are too high to consider geoengineering? But in a sense, you've already answered that question by saying we, we, we should uh, have, it, have it in uh, reserves. It might be a more pertinent question to ask. What do you think the, the major risks of geoengineering are? Oh, I, I think um, if, if I can now adopt the same approach as the previous group, we need to separate geoengineering into carbon dioxide capture and uh, solar radiation management. And in terms of uh, solar radiation management, my own view is that there should be, if possible, a temporary ban on solar radiation management. Uh, I think the unintended consequences of that are extremely difficult to foresee. I'm all in favour of research that would examine possible consequences of putting aerosols up in the stratosphere to reflect radiation away. The concerns expressed by the previous group I, I would match as well. The total cost of managing to put uh, uh, sulphates into the stratosphere is relatively small and the technology is there. And I do think that this is something that needs to be addressed immediately. But now moving on to carbon dioxide capture. Carbon dioxide capture should be dealt with as, when, as well in two forms. One is capture from the atmosphere and one is capture from the oceans. Uh, and I, I think as soon as we move into capture from the oceans, then again we're dealing with an issue uh, of long-range pollution uh, uh, and, and impact problems, so cross-boundary problems. So the, the simple categorization of two is, is not, in my view, sufficient. Um, and uh, let me just go back and make a comment about solar radiation management. Let us suppose that we could all be persuaded that Crutzen is right and we can reduce temperatures in this way we would still not be managing the acidification of the oceans. Uh, in other words, carbon dioxide levels going up means that uh, we would get more carbonic acid formed in the oceans. And why is this a problem? The oceans are part of the ecosystem services for humanity. Uh, it is the oceans that provide the beginning of the food chain. And if we don't understand what is going to happen to the oceans as they become more acidified and there are questions about that already being examined by the scientific community then I would also be very concerned about this even as a potential solution. So I'm focusing then on uh, the, the, these two methods carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere and from the oceans and I would say we should be investing in research in those areas and we need prior regulation, particularly on ocean uh, removal. Uh, no, sorry, I'm... Um, yes, I'm Mr. Bryant. Yes, yeah. Morning, gentlemen. Uh, earlier we were talking about uh, regulating <coughs> geoengineering, and of course it goes from modelling by computer and in the laboratory through to pilot scale and uh, on a diff you know, differing scales in the environment. At what stage do you think the regulation should kick in, uh, assuming that we can get into national agreements? Uh, should it apply to the research throughout or just to quite large-scale applications in the environment? Well, I'm, I should say I'm not an expert on research regulation per se, so with that qualifier, um, my impression is that there is probably some regulation in place for some of the experiments that will be considered. Um, the risks are primarily on um, the transboundary implications. That's, that's where we probably don't have a good structure in place and, and, uh, and need to look uh, much further. And then there's the moral side of where you invest and how you look at options and particularly how you include all the distributional effects there, which would probably kick in much earlier. Um, so uh, I think that the, the, it's, it's clear that we're in that stage once we're in, in the stage of testing. Once we're with testing, and I, I support the previous views that you want regulation in place before you do uh, large-scale testing. Um, for the earlier experiments, uh, in general, I tend to be in favor of, of fairly free research um, uh, so that we can explore these options. And I think we're in, 
too large uncertainty still about many of these options to be able to even design the right regulations. David, do you have a view on this? Yes, I, I certainly uh, believe that early regulation in any issue of this kind is, is essential. That doesn't mean that we leap straight into regulation, but examining what is the optimal form of regulation is well worth doing uh, in advance. Um, I, I think, however, that in terms of solar radiation uh, management, um, I would move fairly swiftly, as I've suggested, into a temporary ban and <coughs> find the feasible way forward for that. Um, I'm not happy about smaller experiments being conducted at this stage in time before the unintended consequences have been uh, fully evaluated. And, and, and we're dealing with an extraordinarily complex issue here. And we all know scientifically that complex phenomena, as complexity increases, we get emergent properties that are not always easy to predict. So I, I do think we need to watch the stratosphere very carefully, um, but at the same time, in terms of regulation of the others, get ahead of the game precisely because, A, you want to keep the public on side. If we lose the public, then we lose the game. And secondly, we want to see that the regulation encourages the right behavior. Car exhaust regulation has always been progressive, saying this, this is the way the new cars have to meet that standard in three years' time, and it has produced the investment in, in the right direction. So if the regulatory system is set out there, everyone knows what the playing field looks like. Yeah, may I just add a comment, just to clarify? Um, on regulation, I think um, we definitely need that sort of regulation once we go towards testing. And I would, I would agree with the suggestion to have a ban, even on, on relatively small-scale testing of solar radiation management. Um, I don't think we can go quickly towards regulation of, say, model experiments of stratospheric aerosol injection that wouldn't even be feasible. I would think that as an alternative or as a complement to development of eventual regulations for the deployment, the sort of consultations that were discussed in the end of the previous panel would be crucial, and those should be international consultations and should be very proactive and engaging the public, because I think that will be a crucial factor um, to understand um, the feasibility, uh, the acceptability of these options, <coughs> and, 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 need, and that discussion needs to play, take place much before political decisions about eventual deployment, uh, and, and, and I think also, also much ahead of uh, actual regulation, except for a regulation to say, let's, let's try and stop it for now. I also think that we need to be realistic here, um, and that's, there's probably a difference between the sort of debate now taking place here in the UK and the debate around the globe, including in, in several different states, which may already be at the stage of small-scale testing of some of, some of these options. Um, so I think the UK is, in a way, also operating as an international actor in the inter international arena, and in a way setting moral standards and um, setting an example for, for how globally we should be approaching this, which is a, a very important side effect of your own considerations, I think, at this stage. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Come Sorry, back no. very briefly, because I, I think that there is a, an important scenario that, that, or set of scenarios that we do need to examine here. If, if we roll forward in time and we reach the point where the worst impacts are happening and uh, you know, temperature rises are quite excessive, and we take on the, the notion that came up in the previous discussion about one country protecting its monsoon and another country finding it's, uh, it's not, uh, not acceptable. This discussion is critically important to have now, well ahead of time, for two reasons. One, because we want to avoid that being done. But the second reason is, knowing what the nature of the possible challenges in the future is a very sobering way of managing the business of defossilizing. We need to really know what the potential disastrous uh, eventualities will be if nations start having to take matters into their own hands and away from the international procedures. Now, earlier, Tim Boswell read out um, five principles that have been uh, laid down by the geoengineering community to uh, guide their research and I, I, I won't read them out again, I'll just read one. Geoengineering is to be regulated as a public good. Uh, 
do you think everybody understands what public good is and who, who, who should define it? Who should decide what is in, in the interest of the general public? David, can we? I feel like saying pass. <laughs> <laughs> you leave that to us, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's obviously a very important issue. And within this, I presume, comes the issue of intellectual property rights as well. Um, so I, I, I think uh, uh, it's a critically important issue to, to understand what we mean by the phrase public good. If we are saying that um, there, there should be no intellectual property rights capable of being awarded in this area, I think I'd be a bit hesitant to back it. Um, in other what's, words, what's your view on I, IPP? Right. So I, I think that IPR, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a very complex issue because if, if we're going to go down the route of carbon dioxide capture from oceans or atmosphere and this is going to be a good thing, we also need to know where is the investment going to come from to take the research into demonstration phase and into the marketplace. And there will be a marketplace with a price of carbon dioxide. Now that's going to be the private sector companies. If we don't allow protection of IPR, are we going to actually inhibit that process of investment? So I, I think I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to simply back uh, the, the pure public good argument without IPR protection. Yes, I would support that. Yeah, I think it's, if these are good options, then we want the private sector to play a role in rolling them out. And then, you know, we might be excluding but again, I, I think for many of these questions, we're, we're so far uh, from uh, large-scale deployment uh, that it, it is difficult to even imagine uh, what we need. But I would say that, in principle, good regulation of the, of the deployment, not regulation of the early stage of research, but regulation of the deployment, uh, but having the private sector play a role might be more effective if we all agree that there are options in that whole range of, of potential techniques that we do want to use. Okay. Um I just want to finish by looking at the developing countries. Obviously, uh, some of the developing countries are already badly affected by climate change, uh, more so than some of the developed countries. Uh, how do you think the international community should involve the developing countries in, in the geoengineering debate? <laughs> That's okay. no, Brian's got the difficult questions today. <laughs> um, I, I think that it's, it's very clear that uh, one of the positive things to come out of Copenhagen and the transformation uh, of the global community between Kyoto and Copenhagen is the much fuller engagement of the emerging powers and of the poorer countries and the recognition that we've now got at least three categories of countries the developed nations, the emerging powers, and the poorer countries. Now, if we're talking about the emerging powers in your question, I would engage them as closely as the developed world, as part of the, uh, um, the world that can afford the investment that we're now talking about into geoengineering research as a possible way forward. The, the uh, poorer countries of the world, I don't believe that this is the issue that they will be raising, and I'm advising several governments in this category. Um, I think the focus there has to be on adaptation and low carbon economic growth. Uh, I, I don't think this is an issue that comes to them. Dr. Van Haas? Well, I, I would slightly disagree here. I think um, it, your, your, first, your first point about the emerging powers is, is clearly right. They need to be involved. And I think if you want a good international regulatory framework, they're going to be crucial. I think they're going to be the ones very cautious once this is brought to the UN uh, because they want to keep all their options open. Um, so it's also a strategic consideration if you do want to move towards some sort of international mechanism. Uh, the more vulnerable ones, I think, are, are the more difficult ones. I think they'll feel threatened by the possibility that, that – the winners will protect their wins and uh, the losers, which clearly are mostly them, uh, will not get anything. Um, so politically, they're already very worried. I think there's a second dimension to it, which is that the, the distributional effects within countries, <coughs> in adaptation, uh, which is, of course, much more local than some of the large-scale uh, solutions that we're talking about here. But these large-scale solutions, not, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, we're talking sort of globally average watts per square meters, but these, these options, and particularly on the solar radiation management side, will have specific local impacts as well. 
And similarly to adaptation, we'll, we'll need to manage those as well. And on the adaptation side, we've seen so many examples. I just heard one last week of a, a little village in Senegal, which was facing increasing flooding. Uh, so you think, you know, go do something about it. Well, the city further downstream was also facing increased flooding. So they made a little canal to spill some of that flood water towards the Atlantic, and the little village got hurt. So this is a sort of adaptation intervention, which we know so many, that has side effects, particularly on the most vulnerable populations, you know, which aren't paying for the solution, so they don't get to have a say. I'm really afraid that we'll get similar parallels on the geoengineering side, and I would really like the international debate that will be fostered, and that we had a little discussion about at the end of the last panel as well, to really include attention for that human dimension, and to try and involve that side of the debate early on. And they don't come to the table naturally, and certainly not um, based on a call for comments by, the, the, by a, a research council in the UK or anywhere else in the developed world. With respect to the international discussion, where should that be carried on? Should it be in the United Nations? And if so, is it being carried on there, to your knowledge? Or should it be um, going on in the scientific stroke engineering communities, or both? I, I, I would have said in terms of uh, the scientific community, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change ought to be addressing this issue. It's, uh, it's obviously something that has to become uh, a part of their, their uh, uh, four yearly report, in my view, and that would be the proper focus for the international scientific community. Uh, in terms of the international community, again, I would, I would turn to United Nations bodies. Uh, um, UNEP, it's a pity we haven't got the UNEP uh, uh, person here, uh, is an obvious body. Um, but I, I think this, this is an issue that is, um, in terms of regulation, uh, would need to be addressed at a G20 heads of states meeting to have a real impact. Um, and I, I do think in terms of the uh, solar radiation management, it's of sufficient importance that it ought to be raised at that level. Dr. Van Hulst, do you have a view on this? Um, well, I, I'd, let, me, let me just be, be frank and say that I hesitate in the sense that I worry that if we elevate it to too high a political level too early, we may be sending the wrong signals. Um, so that would be my concern putting it that high on the agenda right away. Uh, I do think that there are more technically oriented United Nations bodies that would be more appropriate, certainly the IPCC, and I would hope that along with possibly some conscious efforts at consultation, we should primarily be looking at risks and, and at you know, whether this is an appropriate thing and might actually be then guiding us towards more investments on the mitigation and adaptation sides. Uh, I would hope that those discussions in those UN bodies would then trigger a much wider debate involving a larger range of stakeholders and a more diverse set of stakeholders and have been uh, taking part in this discussion so far. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Tim Muzzle. Coming across to me, uh, gentlemen, that it, it <coughs> seems that we are looking at this, or our witnesses are looking at this, as being a contingency if um, defossilization doesn't do the job. And I suppose it's the nature of a contingency that needs to be ready to go fairly quickly if that situation arises, although we're not committing ourselves to that yet. And I'm really asking a little bit more, if I may, about um, research into the impacts and the importance of doing that now. And also, and this has been touched on in evidence, uh, in particular research into the differential impacts, either by nation states, and that may be a contingent matter, or regionally, or within quite small areas or different categories of people. I mean, I could think of hill farming, for example, if one was looking at that. Um, and I just wonder if um, Sir David and Dr. Carnals could say something about the importance of that research, as it were, digging down into this, in terms of physical impacts, also possibly economic impacts, uh, which I suspect spills back into public acceptability. And the final point would be to bring all this together, um, what about uh, having some prior understanding about whether or not there needed to be some compensation mechanism so that if we did have to use these weapons at short notice, if I may call them that, uh, would we have got um, the machinery in place and we wouldn't be bogged down in yet another round of international argument about who should compensate who 
or, or what could be done to mitigate it in individual cases. Is that clear? So it's really looking at, I think, it, with the backdrop of possible need to deploy at short notice and a need to keep political debate going, what research do we need to do? And in particular, how do we need to handle the findings of that research in relation to smaller impacts on individual groups? Sure, yeah. Well, I think these are the critical questions, um, and also the questions where we have to be quite honest, that particularly for the solar radiation management techniques. We're now in a stage of such high uncertainties that we, we're not really yet doing risk management. Um, yeah. it's, it's dealing with vast uncertainty. So we need to get on with that in some sense. So, yeah, getting on with that in some sense to get a, a slightly clearer picture on, on what we're actually looking at is, 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 is important. Um, so I, I also think we're not yet at a stage where we can do proper economic impact assessments. I think the uncertainties are, are probably too large for most of these techniques, although we can do some back-of-the-envelope calculations, possibly. Um, I would caution against purely economic impact assessments in the sense that they tend to lose out on the perspective of the most vulnerable groups, which don't yeah. count much on the economic analysis side sometimes. So that, that's something to consider. Um, on the compensation side, again, uh, my previous comment uh, hints at the fact that I think we're, we're very early in the game to be talking about that even. Uh, but if we were, uh, the attribution question is going to be as difficult or probably more difficult as it is for uh, mitigation or for, for carbon dioxide uh, emissions. So I think that's, that's a critical one uh, that we need to consider in, in, in how we treat this as a, as a risk management option in the end. Uh, we're going to be, if, if we would ever deploy these options, we'd be throwing it out on the world, and the attribution would make it difficult for, for anyone actually to take the blame. Uh, so there will be losers, but the losers won't be able to defend themselves in, uh, in, in court, possibly, to some extent, sure. unless we go towards uh, precautionary principles and so. But then from my perspective, at this stage of the game, uh, we should be keeping them off the table, mostly. Thank you. So David, any comments on that? Um, I, I think the, uh, the issue in terms of the research into impacts would need to take into account, both in terms of uh, the physical and economic impacts, would need to take into account the impacts from rising temperature. In other words, we are talking about an issue that would come into play if we are in that uh, yeah. piece of the distribution curve that we're hoping we're not going to move into. So this is going to be playing off a temperature rise of let's say three and a half degrees centigrade against the impacts of whatever that might happen if we uh, for example put up uh, um, sulfates into the stratosphere. So there are always choices aren't there I mean, yes. between two difficult scenarios. Right. So I, I think this is an enormously complicated uh, series of questions. If we look at the impacts from temperature rise uh, whether it's purely temperaturized, whether it's the changes in weather patterns, rainfall patterns, and therefore food productivity, uh, sea level rises, if you look at all those impacts against the possible impacts of, uh, of an intervention of the kind we're now discussing. Um, I, I think that this is an issue that we, we can't really tackle in advance. Uh, you know, we're, we're now talking 40 years in advance of the situation arising. But we just need to remember it's going to be a balance um, of, uh, of impact. I'm going to ask you a contingency question right. prompted by that, which is if we were into that position or thinking ahead at least to look at the scenario, what kind of mechanism would be the best one for looking at this? Because clearly there are political feedback loops and inputs as well and people will be trying to avoid a situation where they or their country or their region may lose out. I mean, how on earth do we keep the integrity of this process if we need it? And the management of it because of its scale. We're, we're already seeing, um, Mr. Boswell, the, the, the problems of trying to achieve equity in negotiations around uh, dealing with CO2 emissions. Sure. And uh, the equity issues that would arise around what we're now discussing would be much more severe. And that's why I think that the most important thing is to recognize the problems associated with going down this route so that we amplify the need to go down the route of defossilizing our economy. Thank you. Okay. 
Um, on that note, we'll bring this session to an end. Could I thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Malas, for, uh, for coming and joining us this morning. And thank you, uh, Professor Sir David King, for joining us uh, too. Uh, we'll move on to our third panel for the morning. Uh, if we could let the Minister know that we're oh, ready. I disagree with you more. Oh, really? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I can't wait 50 years. Thank you very much. I must come up with it. This is really interesting. It's like a Welcome our third uh, panel in, in what has been a, a pretty hectic, uh, a pretty hectic uh, morning looking at uh, geoengineering and the regulation of. And we warmly welcome uh, Joan Rudick, MP, the Minister of State for the Department of Energy and Climate Change. We seem to be seeing a lot of each other uh, at the moment, <laughs> uh, uh, Joan. And we're both working on the energy uh, bill. Uh, a warm welcome to Professor uh, David McKay, the Chief Scientific Advisor of the Department for Energy and Climate Change. We haven't met you formally before, but you're very, very welcome to, uh, to our committee, Professor McKay. Uh, and last but by no means, they're representing uh, uh, RCUK, Research Councils UK, uh, Professor Nick Pigeon. Welcome uh, to you all. We're all very tight for time. We're finishing at 25 past uh, 11. Um, so if we could have our answers really sort of quite tight, we'd be very, very grateful. And I'm going to start with Graham Stringer. What sort of urgency does the government give to research into geoengineering? And I suppose so that we're all talking about the same uh, thing. It might be useful to uh, have the government's definition of what they understand to be geoengineering. Uh, thank you for the question. Can I first of all um, apologise to the committee for the fact that I understand for some completely unknown reason you failed to receive, and it's undoubtedly our fault, we were, didn't succeed in delivering to you our written evidence. I understand you've now got it, but obviously yeah, yeah. you would have appreciated it much sooner, and I apologise for that. Um, I will answer your question on urgency, and then I'll ask David if uh, he would like to define uh, the geoengineering, which he uh, knows that we... Um, uh, uh, understand, uh, just in case I uh, fail to be precise in the technical terms. Is there an urgency in this matter? Our view is there is not. Uh, we do not think that at the moment uh, it, it, is, it is a priority for government uh, that uh, the techniques that are uh, involved are ones which uh, are far from being uh, developed to the point of viability at the moment. Uh, that is quite different from saying one shouldn't keep a watching brief, but we don't think there is an urgency uh, in terms of, uh, of this particular dimension to addressing climate change. What we do believe is utterly urgent is uh, to continue on the route which this government has followed so keenly of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, in this country, of legislating to that effect, and of, of participating in the international um, discussions about trying to arrive at a global deal which goes beyond the Copenhagen Accord that we have just struck so that we can ensure that the world uh, effort is designed to keep us within no more than a two degrees Celsius temperature rise. That is the priority of these times and that is where the government is on that matter. <coughs> 
I think in DEC we recognise the same categories that the Royal Society use in, in their report. We recognise the important distinction between carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management. I think we would include in geoengineering some forms of activity that I think would be viewed as innocuous and legal, such as someone growing trees and putting them into a disused coal mine. That activity would be essentially the reverse of the uh, current coal mining activity. Um, and I, I think we would include that as a, an example of a small, small scale geoengineering activity. We would also in, include, I think, the growing of biomass for co-firing in a uh, power station that has carbon capture and storage. We would in include that as another example of a, a geoengineering geo option that, again, I, I think wouldn't be viewed as, as uh, politically uh, unacceptable. Thanks. So, so let me be, be clear so that I, I understand you're both saying the same thing. I understand what Joan's saying, that we want to concentrate on reducing uh, carbon dioxide. But doesn't the government's energy policy and the security of supply uh, depend on developing carbon capture uh, technology? But wasn't that what Ed, Ed Miliband said? And if I understand what you're saying, Professor Mackay, is carbon capture is understood to be geoengineering, but it's not getting urgent treatment. Well, yes, I'm sorry to. I'm sorry to understand. I'm sorry to have to have complicated things. Clearly, uh, we, we do have a, a, a policy of developing um, coal power stations with carbon capture and uh, and storage. If those power stations were used to co-fire biomass, then that would cause carbon dioxide reduction. So I was just wanting to give a complete no, that's what answer I really wanted that, to that, understand. that there are some forms of geoengineering that clearly are possible and are also are perhaps not controversial. Um, so what you're really talking about that you're, you're not putting research into is solar, solar radiation management. Is that, is that too simplistic an understanding? I think the, the, the minister... The Minister's answer was uh, that, yes, the, the more controversial forms of, of geoengineering, especially the forms of geoengineering that would have cross-boundary uh, right. impacts, are not a, a research priority. We, we do think the, they are important concepts um, that we would like to understand better, uh, and we, we're happy to see the EPSRC, for example, <coughs> investing in, in research into these options. But it's not an urgent priority to, to have research into these boundary crossing methods, which would include solar radiation management and also some other forms of, of geoengineering um, uh, that do carbon dioxide removal, for example, using the oceans. Again, those would have cross-boundary impacts. Uh, we view these as, uh, as Professor King said earlier, as interesting options to, to keep on the table, but they're very much options of, of last resort, and, and they're, they're not an urgent research priority right now. Can, can I just, you know, for the record, uh, Mr. Wills, make it very, very clear uh, that whereas, <clears throat> and perhaps I was foolish to ask <laughs> our chief scientific advisor to, to give the definition, because in its broadest sense, uh, it does include things uh, that, that are already part of government programme. So in its broadest sense, yes, carbon capture and storage, where it's considered to be geoengineering, uh, is part of the programme and is a matter of considerable urgency. And we are applying ourselves to that, not least in the energy bill, which is uh, currently going through Parliament. So there is a distinction uh, which I think we need to be very clear about. The areas that we are uh, not pursuing, except in a small way, which I'm happy to explain to you if you want no. that detail, are those of carbon dioxide removal <coughs> of the kind uh, that, that is I, I major to be clear, we were and solar radiation talking about management. the same things, really. Cause yeah. We're, yeah. We're, we're, I mean, j just going back to your original answer, George, I, I understand. Are you not, aren't you open to the charge of being complacent? That you know, Copenhagen was, to, to put it mildly, was not a success. There is no guarantee that the international community will uh, reduce the, the the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Don't you think we should be doing research for a, for a plan B uh, if the international community fails, as it patiently did in Copenhagen? Well, first of all, I don't agree that the international community failed in Copenhagen. We did not succeed in getting certain things. We did not get as great reductions as we uh, sought to get. 
and we did not get a timetable to move towards a legally binding treaty. But we have got, for the first time ever, agreement between developed and developing countries that they will uh, make uh, changes in their emission reductions. Uh, those are to be codified, they are going to be uh, delivered by the end of this month. Um, and we have got the agreement that we need the world community to stay within two degrees centigrade rise, that all our activities uh, in reductions should be aimed to keep us uh, within that framework and to avoid dangerous climate change. Uh, so, I don't agree it was a failure, it's a good start in my view, and it's got to be built upon. And I think the danger of adopting a Plan B, if that were even feasible, which I would question, but the danger in adopting a Plan B is that you don't apply yourself to Plan A. And the point of Plan A is it is all entirely doable. We know how to do these things. Every country in the world knows how to reduce, how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. With a financing mechanism, it's possible to help the developing countries that can't otherwise afford it. And if the argument is we fail to make an international agreement of, of the best substance on this occasion, then how much more difficult might it be to create a regulatory, uh, a regulatory framework for geoengineering, which you know has greater implications uh, for the whole world in terms of possible risks and environmental damage and concern. So uh, if one is difficult, then I would suggest the other might be more difficult. And that's why the priority must be to enhance and move further beyond what we have with the Copenhagen Accord. Now, I understand the priority and I, I, I understand uh, the arguments, but it isn't, I, I don't agree with you about Copenhagen. I think it's a fiasco and a failure, but we can, we can disagree about that. But it, it isn't the danger uh, with the policy that it's all, all, all the government's eggs or all our eggs in, in one basket. It, and if that does fail, then there is not a, a, a plan B. And shouldn't the government be at least considering in a theoretical sense uh, what choices it would make within the sort of range of geoengineering uh, possibilities uh, that it, if things go wrong and there has to be a, a, a different approach, shouldn't the government be considering that? Well, it's not to say that the government shouldn't consider. It's a question of uh, urgency, which is the question I was asked. Well, if it has considered, so, has it made so a choice? So I said then? it's clearly not, um, in our view, a matter of urgency. It is clear that we have other and uh, much greater priorities, which we need to apply ourselves to very vigorously, and we will. Um, and so what I am suggesting is that uh, we look to more of a watching brief and that we do things at a sort of de minimis level. And I think that very much accords, as I understand it, with what the Royal Society is suggesting. And I think they're a very good uh, barometer in these matters. So, for example, uh, we have got uh, some small expenditure on uh, modelling uh, techniques, for example. And I can, uh, if the committee has time, Mr Willis, I can just say, you know, what research is being undertaken with government money. I think I'd rather we, you, I think Fine. that's in your note to us, isn't it? It is. That. Yes. So, no, we'll, we'll leave that on, on the record. Well, just within that spectrum, I, I, have the government made any choices? Does it have any priorities of, the, uh, of which way it would want to go if Plan B was necessary? I think it would be entirely prem premature because we're dealing with, uh, uh, with techniques here which are not proven techniques, which have great risks, which don't have a regulatory framework. And frankly, at the moment, it would be, uh, well, I think quite ridiculous for government uh, to be making any choices. But in terms of, of the major areas uh, where, where there is interest, injecting sulphate aerosols into the stratosphere, for example. Uh, there's some current work which has got government funding. Uh, there's been uh, work on low-level cloud development, um, which again has got some government funding. And there's been uh, another study on the impact of oceanic iron fertilization on cloud formation, again. So, you know, some of these areas which are the ones that are particularly uh, being put forward by those who advocate these kind of solutions to Plan B, there is what I would call a watching brief taking place and some small amount of government funding. And, you know, we, as you continue to question, I can uh, indicate further what the government is interested in doing. 
I think, I think just before we leave this particular round, I think you've made it clear that you don't want to spend a great deal of money in terms of putting money into research. Correct. Uh, and we'll come on to RCUK UK in a, in, in a second to look at some of the work that's going on there. But surely, Minister, you've got a, an interest in, in fact, uh, supporting international regulation. Uh, because if somebody in the United States or China or Indonesia actually uh, goes heavily into uh, geoengineering in terms of large-scale experiments, that may well affect not only uh, neighbouring countries, but of course in terms of, for instance, of work in the oceans, could uh, significantly impact ultimately um, on our sort of ecosystem as well. So what are we doing in terms of that global regulation? And How I do we fit right into that? that Chairman. Sir David King in the previous panel actually suggested that we ban temporarily uh, solar radiation management techniques yes. because once you put trillions of mirrors in the sky, for example, uh, they're irre irretrievable. And, um, do you have an opinion on that, Chairman? Oh. Uh, I do, indeed. I mean, I've, I think, first of all, we need to look at uh, what might be being done within any particular research group uh, and, you know, the extent to which we seek uh, to put any legal constraints on that. Uh, when it's uh, a case of theoretical work, when it's modelling work, uh, obviously government uh, does not seek to put any restraint on that. Uh, I think the Royal Society has suggested there should be a code of conduct um, and for you know, research at a certain level a code of conduct is probably entirely appropriate and we would very much support that. But um, as you have just uh, uh, indicated uh, Mr Willis and I didn't hear Sir David King but um, I, can, uh, I can imagine why he would have said what he said that there are very, very clear implications for every country in the world if any individual country were to start on a course of interfering with our atmosphere yeah. in that, to that sort of degree. So it is absolutely the case that we need to develop uh, an international regulation uh, that comes before any deployment. Yeah. Now there's an in-between <coughs> stage which would be uh, in-field experimentation. Uh, and we may need to be thinking about that and what implications that might have. I think my question is, have you done anything in terms of discussions with international partners about the possible regulation of geoengineering? I'm not talking about domestic geoengineering, which sure. I, don't, I think from this committee's point of view would not be regarded as geoengineering. But have you had any discussions? I mean, yes or no, really? Uh, there are continuing discussions, obviously, between people in the department and people who, who are engaged in this work. And what we have been considering is setting up within the department uh, a working group that would actually study right. this issue. Now, we are considering that positively, yeah. but we, we are also very aware of the position of the Royal Society. Um, and we will, I think, need to work closely with them because they are also setting up a series of working groups. And so, A, we don't want to duplicate. B, there is undoubtedly more expertise, um, not uh, to embarrass our chief scientific officer, but <laughs> more expertise uh, in the whole of the Royal Society than we could possibly have within DEC itself. So, we are uh, considering this matter. We are aware that this is work that needs to be done, but we want to proceed in the um, you know, most useful way, and that is why we're continuing to have discussions with the Royal Society. I don't know if David might want to add something. Well, to that. Uh, just briefly, okay. can I just bring in? Something? I'm grateful, Minister, not yeah. least because I fear I have to go in a moment, but may I um, just pick you up on what you've said? I, I understand why, in a sense, you're devolving the, the scientific burden to the Royal Society, but in terms of, as it were, the ministerial cloud, you need to be, introduce, um, to be introducing some of your counterpart ministers either in the EU or Climate Change Forum or whatever to the importance of this. Is this something that you are doing as a department as well as the, um, as it were, the professional scientific network? Uh, I, I, I personally, and I don't think if I, if I, I can't recall uh, any 
ministerial involvement in discussions. I certainly, as myself, uh, and I don't believe our Secretary of State either, has been uh, holding such discussions. Um, so I think at this stage it's, it's unlikely that we have had any ministerial discussions on regulation. Um, but we are aware our officials are alive to the issue uh, and uh, it is something that we know needs to be done. And of course the IPCC is going to be reporting itself and we have taken a lot of our leads uh, from reports from the IPCC. Um, it is clear that if there is to be regulation, it is going to have to be in some international body, whether a scientific body uh, or whether the UN itself. Uh, but clearly, you know, this is something that will have to be developed over okay, time. Okay, no, you've made that point. You mentioned the Royal Society, and I know that Ian Causey wishes to pick up. Yeah, thanks, um, quite interesting, you know, a lot of what's been said so far is about the government almost holding a watching brief on this and waiting to see what the developments are. Um, and I just wonder to what extent that's enough, in, certainly in terms of public opinion, because it strikes me that if you look at quite recent things, GM crops being one, uh, even climate change, really, there's, there's quite a significant dislocation between where public opinion is and where scientific opinion is. Uh, and I could see geoengineering ever so easily fitting into that category yet again. And the Royal Society did say in the, the recent report in it that the acceptability of geoengineering will be determined as much by social, legal and political issues as by scientific and technical factors. And do you agree with that assessment? And if you do, what, are, what will the government do to encourage debate on the social acceptability of geoengineering? Well, I don't think it's for the government to encourage a debate on the social acceptability of geoengineering, because that presumes that the government has taken a view that geoengineering is a good thing, and that we should actually deploy. Uh, we have not taken that view. Um, I think that it is important to, to, uh, to involve uh, the public in discussions as these things develop. Uh, it's important uh, not to allow the public to get into a position where the public has been in alarmed or is ignorant. So it's very important that the dialogue includes uh, public communication. And it's one of the considerations uh, that we make about it, setting up a working group that should we do so, then indeed we would uh, you know, want to see uh, that it contained a wide spectrum of, of people, including social scientists, ethicists, as well as scientists and, and administrators. So you know, we, we're alive to the fact that there would need to be uh, public engagement, and we know that, I think it's the NR, NARC, isn't yeah. it, I think, who have a public dialogue uh, programme that they are about to launch. Uh, so it's important to talk with the public and to avoid ignorance and prejudice, but at the same time it is not for the government to persuade the public uh, of the need for this. Well, thank you, yes. I, I, I'm from RC UK um, uh, perspective, I'll just make one comment about research. Obviously, as, as you know, a small amount of money uh, following the Royal Society report will be going into fundamental research on, on top of the research that's currently being done. Um, and also the public dialogue has been uh, initiati initiated. That will be the f a first, really, across the world. Um, points earlier, actually, there, I think for the UK to do that, that's fine, but we might want to think more widely because it, this is an international question, so the poor and people in, in other countries will have an interest uh, in, in the outcome of geoengineering research. But the point about research I would like to make is that Although it's not urgent, um, the science and the social and ethical research should come together at an early stage. Um, very often, those of us who study public acceptance of technology, nuclear power is a good example of this, um, social scientists were only asked 20 years after nuclear had become extremely unpopular to actually look at why this might have occurred. I think we've learned that. Um, lessons. So uh, RCUK and ESRC, I know in particular, are very keen that um, as research progresses on the science, research on the ethical, legal, economic and the public acceptability issues also takes place as well. I mean, in the first session we had this morning where we had people from, uh, uh, from different countries by video link uh, to participating, mm. um, and I think they all came to a conclusion that you know, whilst the NERC was going off and doing this consultation here, it was actually much more important that there were international talks going on and protocols and
things being established there. So, so, so what is the government doing to try and encourage that to happen? Uh, and if we do continue with this public consultation mm -hmm. through the, NRE, the NERC, how can we uh, diminish criticism that actually this is what we always do, we always consult the public and then actually it has no effect on what the policy is at the end of the day anyway? I think if I may say so, uh, Mr Corsi, your questioning is, is, is still, in my view, premature. That, you know, we're not at that, at that point and our first, uh, our first decision is, and the committee clearly may like to comment upon this, is to whether we set up a separate uh, working group within government uh, to look at all of these issues or whether we work with the Royal Society to look at all of these issues. I think that's, you know, we are going to do, we, we are going to do something. It's not that we're doing nothing. Uh, we, we just want to, uh, you know, see the lie of the land and make our decisions as to how we progress. But whatever uh, progression is, is undertaken, it will, uh, quite rightly, um, as uh, Professor Pigeon has said, it, it will quite rightly engage social scientists and others alongside scientists. No, so I, mean, I can understand why the government would take that view, uh, and you know, I don't necessarily disagree with what it's worth, but, but it's not necessarily premature to take a decision that this would be better dealt with internationally rather than nationally, is it? Well, I think it's going to be for the working group uh, to whether with us or jointly, whether was, or however it is done, we need a basis on which people have the opportunity to do some work, to do some thinking, and to come up with some proposals. Because it's not possible for a government to just leap into an international negotiation. You know, we have to develop our own thinking. We have to decide what it is uh, we think is appropriate uh, to put forward in an international forum. And we have to uh, decide uh, which international forum it would be appropriate to attempt to engage with. So, at the moment, you know, none of these things have been worked through, and that's why I can't say to you, we, we, <coughs> you know, we, we are just going to uh, rush off to the UN or wherever uh, and say, let's all start this debate. Clearly, the initiative might come from others, but we have got to get our own framework sorted out as to what we think is appropriate, and that is work that has not yet been done. Yeah, can, I, can I bring in Professor Pigeon here, because I, I'm really quite confused about RCUK's uh, position and certainly uh, the evidence that you've, that you've given us. There is a Convention on uh, Biological Diversity, which is an international convention which deals with issues surrounding the oceans. Um, and yet, in your evidence to us, you're suggesting that any sort of uh, uh, regulatory framework um, is, is premature. And yet, there is a regulatory framework you know, in existence, which presumably the UK participates um, in developing. Yeah. I, I, I should add, I'm not a lawyer myself, so I can't comment in detail on the law. I'm not either, so we're on common um, ground. My, my reading of the evidence, which I have some input to, but not, uh, obviously not all of it, um, is that RCUK are saying, as many have said today, that we have a heter heterogeneous field here that we call geoengineering, so many, many techniques. And it, it is likely that some techniques and deployments, if they were to come about, will fall under existing regulation and others will um, fall um, between uh, aspects of regulation and for others there may be nothing at all. Yeah. And again that's, what, that's why we need the analytic work now to look at what regulation applies. This is, to, to take another example, with nanotechnology five years ago we were in a very similar, similar situation and the GAPS analysis was, I think DEFRA um, uh, sponsored that to look at what areas of regulation would apply to certain nanomaterials and that's been very valuable, va valuable for them to look at um, uh, where the gaps are so I think that's we are as, so, as it's so said, are you doing that then? Is, is, is RCUK doing it? Not at this point in time. Because the government is isn't doing it <coughs> the minister just said the government isn't Sure, and I you're mean, not as a chief scientist but we are at what could be said an upstream moment. Yes. I think that's the way it's described right. in emergence of a technology. What is an upstream moment? Then? So early that the uncertainties are wide. Um, compare it to nuclear energy, which yeah. is a mature technology. We know what it is. Yeah. People have views on it. 
Uh, in the upstream moment, we don't even know how it will develop and what responses there will be. There's very low public knowledge, which is a big challenge for public engagement, and, and great uncertainties. So we're in a, a phase which is, which is very murky and difficult to give definitive answers. It's not that people are not trying to give answers. It's just very, very early. I think what we're tr trying to get, and the last word with you, Minister, because um, we're, we're about to close. I think what we're trying to get is that the UK is arguably, well, I would say definitely, the world's second scientific nation, second to the United States. You know, we have a position of real leadership in here. We are a nation surrounded by oceans, and we've given, with, I think with respect to, the, to your government, uh, to our government, um, a real lead in terms of climate science. Um, and yet here is an area where clearly it's a long way off. Um, we're not even prepared to seriously lead the debate in terms of a regulatory framework. And do you not find that disappointing? Or? No, because as I've indicated at the outset of this uh, evidence session, uh, we have real priorities which we are working on. I mean, we, we have got within every part of government people, all of whom are engaged in moving us to a low carbon economy and making the emissions cuts that we have committed to in law. Now, that is, is a way forward to deal with climate change. It's a proven way forward. And we need to do as much of that as we can. And we need to work as intensively as we can in the international community to ensure that as much of that as possible happens. So, you know, there is no question about the leadership continuing in, in this government and in this country. And you're absolutely right about the climate science. But what I have made clear is not that we are unaware and totally neglectful of this area of endeavour. It is that we have not prioritised it, and it is that we are on the point of making some decisions about how we as a government should move forward. So we are aware of what is required. It will be, undoubtedly, some international regulation that we need to have that in place before there's any question of deployment. But we think deployment is rather a long way off, and therefore we do have time, and we shouldn't be panicked into this. We know what we're doing, we understand the issues, we will look to international regulation in due course, we will play our part in that. And, you know, as I've indicated to this committee, and the committee may like to uh, uh, comment on it, uh, we, we either set up a working group within government or we work with those who have clearly led this field to date and that is the Royal Society. That is the point at which we are at and uh, you know, we, we, we will be active. Okay, Minister, thank you very, very much indeed uh, for your presence this uh, morning. Thank you Professor David Mackay, Professor uh, Nick Pidgeon, order, order. <coughs> <laughs> Portcullis House, Line 3, The Thatcher Room 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 <laughs> <laughs>